Welcome back, church family, and anybody else tuning in on YouTube. I'm Charles Gregory. Today we're walking through Genesis, and we're going to continue our walk through Genesis by picking it up in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. This is this chapter in verse 2 is, is recorded as the, the mark of the teaching the, the, the tenth generations, if you will. It's in the book of Genesis, it's broken up into ten toledos or generations of and this is the final one that's going to be discussed and this is the generations of Jacob which is interesting because Joseph becomes a very prominent figure uh, as he is the vehicle which God uses to save Israel he's the vehicle that God uses to, to protect the, the people of Israel and the culture of Israel to get them into Egypt to survive this this great famine that we're going to read about later in, in Genesis. However, with that said, it's really though it is the generations of Jacob. Why? Well, even though Joseph is a, is a primary figure as we're going to see, it's Jacob that was the spiritual patriarchal leader up through the end of this this book the book of Genesis in in when when he's recorded his passing and then Joseph is recording his passing it's interesting in, in Genesis chapter 50 Joseph reminds the, the his brothers of the covenant that God made with Abraham Isaac and Jacob so if you want to turn there with me briefly if you want to leave your your finger in Genesis chapter 37 uh, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on, on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So Jacob, this is, this is the Bible is, is accurate. These are, this is the final Toledoth, if you will, or it's the final list of the generations of, and, and Jacob was the, the last great patriarchal leader that is recorded, that his generations are, are recorded in the book of Genesis. So, without further ado, let's have a, a, a prayer and let's, let's jump right in. Please pray with me. Almighty Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the the history and the lessons that we get to learn from your word. Please help our hearts and our minds to be open to your word and to your instruction and to the prodding of your spirit. Please help your, your, your word to, to convict us where needed and encourage us where needed. Uh, please be with our land. Uh, one thing that became uh, if it wasn't already evidently clear to me uh, last night is that our nation is, is polarized, split over various issues. Please help us to be a, a light amongst uh, the darkness. Help us to be peacemakers in the midst of division and help us to, to show your love and your truth, the only truth that matters to the world around us. Uh, please be with uh, our, our Governor Gavin Newsom and our, our President Donald J. Trump. Please bless them both to make righteous and, and healthy decisions so that we might live peaceful lives in this land. Help us to, to constantly be in your word and constantly be in two-way communication with you. Praising you and talking to you in prayer and listening to you by reading your word daily. Please do a, a please, especially Father, bless the Ferris family. Please bless the McGowan family, uh, and please bless Kenny and, and Stacy as they are. Since we're now in red in this county, as they are getting everything hooked back up, so that we can, with some modifications, meet in person in our building starting this Sunday and still have a good live stream for those who aren't feeling well or for those who are especially at, at high risk. Please continue to heal our land, Almighty God. And it's through your blessed Son name, in the name of Christ, Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get into it. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. 
Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. So we had just looked at, at the generations of, of Esau, and now we are transitioning. Joseph, uh, continuing in verse 2, Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of, of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. I want to pause there for a moment. Joseph had to work with and like his brothers, and that's important to, to, to note. You know, Joseph was not just always sitting around with his father. I think sometimes we can get that image when if we gloss over these stories. He was out there working. He was 17 year old, he was out there working. But he was being used, as we continue to read too, uh, we'll retouch on this, but it sounds like he was being a tattletale. And perhaps his father was encouraging that. Perhaps his father was trying to set him up as some sort of, of a manager. Should should Israel, Jacob, should Israel have known better than to use Joseph in this fashion? Now, what happens when parents play favorites with their children? What happened early on in between Jacob, who, who became Israel, so Israel and Esau? What happened between them early on in their lives because their mom and their dad both chose a favorite. It was devastating. It, 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 it caused problems between mom and dad. It caused problems between brothers. It was not healthy. But yet, Israel, unfortunately, did not learn this lesson. Why did Israel not learn this lesson? And here's, a, here's an interesting thing we can, we can glean from from passages like this when uh, when you look at exodus chapter 20 uh verse 4 and 6 he's he's talking about verses 4 through 6 rather god is 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 telling the people they should not the israelites they will not create <laughs> somebody's dreaming they will not create uh idols they will not worship idols and in verse 5 he says you shall not worship them or serve them for i the lord your god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Why do I mention that? What is the number one way we teach our kids? Either good or bad. How do we do that? How do we teach our kids good behaviors or bad behaviors? Do we sit down and tell them, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this, and you don't need to do this, and then they learn that way? Or do they learn by observing patterns of behavior? Just like when we're walking through Genesis, we're, we're trying to use some critical thinking skills, we're trying to make sure we keep things in context, and we're looking at patterns of behavior that God deals with from the beginning all the way through today. And we're trying to learn from, from his story and not make those negative behaviors again, but rather create healthy behaviors that will make us more effective in the service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So what can we learn from this as parents? Well, Israel is repeating the negative mistakes that his parents made. And God says with, with idolatry, hey, if you hate me, that's remembered on the third, fourth generations. Now, uh, that doesn't mean he's condemning kids for things, for the sins of the parents. We can go to other scriptures about that. That's not happening. But he, he's making a, a, a statement here. 
You know, you look at uh, things like alcoholism. You know, some people we now know are, are genetically predis well, genetically predisposed to being alcoholics. But what came first? What came first? Was that genetic key always there? Or was it some over drinker along the line? We don't know. They created a, a, a mutation. We don't know. But this we do know. If I, as a parent, whether I've got that gene or not, don't show my kids a pattern of drinking, it's much more likely that my children will not drink. If I am a drinker and drug user, and that's the example that I set for my children, my children are more likely to follow in that behavior. This is basic child rearing and, and, and psychology. Our kids learn through patterns of behavior by watching us. Another passage that I like to go to is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 15. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 15. And this really breaks it down. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What's God commanding? God saying, hey, parents, teach your kids. Teach your kids by the way you walk. And then as you go, as they see you dealing with life, talk to them about why you're doing things the way you're doing them. Bring God's word into your home. Bring God's word at the dinner table. Explain, hey, I had this thing going on at work, and I dealt with this conflict this way because this is what God's Word says. We've got financial issues that we're dealing with, and we're dealing with stewardship, and we're putting God first, and we're giving, we're tithing, whatever, because this is what God's Word says. We have to pattern behaviors for our kids that show that we love the Lord, and we love the Lord by, by handling His Word and putting it to, to work in our lives, by, by obeying, by worshiping Him. We have to show our kids how to pray. We have to show our kids how to praise. It's not the preacher's job. It's not the youth minister's job. That's my job as a dad. That's your job as parents. Now, certainly those other things are, are useful helpers, but ultimately, I'm accountable. I'm accountable for what I do in my home and, and how I help my, my son up or how I help him succeed or, or, or fail. Ultimately, that's on me. Verse 10 uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build and houses full of all good things which you did not fill and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant and you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt, out of the houses, house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. If we want to be blessed, and we want our children to be blessed, we have to bring them into our relationship with Jesus. And when we do that by 
talking with them and taking opportunities to teach them as we walk with them. I think that's radically different than the public education school model and Bible school model, Sunday school model that has developed today. Now with that said, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having group schools and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with, with having Sunday school. I've taught Sunday school classes for years. I think they're great. What I'm saying is those things cannot be done to the exclusion or to the uh, to, to release me, if you will, from my responsibilities as a parent. Because regardless of, of how, how long I send my, my kid to, to school, ultimately, ultimately, how I live at home is going to be a huge part in whether or not my children, my son, has a successful faith and, 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 and walk with the Lord. Let's continue reading in, in, in Genesis chapter 37. So Israel, they really didn't do Joseph any favors here. Now, obviously, for those of you who know the story, you know God's providence was in here, and God really made some amazing things happen using Joseph. But, but Israel didn't learn the lesson they could have learned from seeing the things that happened because of his father's behaviors. Father and mother's behaviors. So verse 5, Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept these sayings in mind. What do I get from this? Young people, do you have a filter? Well, older folks do. Do you have a filter between what you think right here and what comes out of right here? Do we have a filter between our thoughts and our mouth? If we do not, we must develop one. Why do I say that? We live in the, in the arena of social media, and social media has allowed people to say things that would get their teeth knocked out on the playground when I was a kid. Now, I am not, I am not uh, uh, promoting violence or bullying or anything like that. Times are very different now than they used to be, and, and times in the past were not all bad, but they weren't all good either. So what am I saying, though? It's very easy for us to get used to, because we're not looking at someone's face, because we're not seeing the hurt and the disappointment, and because there's no immediate consequences of our actions, it's very easy to get used to saying things that in the past children learned to filter because there would have been consequences. And in this case, because these things were not filtered, Joseph is going to have severe consequences. Do, does everybody need to know every thought that I have? Absolutely not. It is unwise. It, 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 it potentially puts myself in a, in a position to be hurt or to be frowned upon or looked down upon and, and to ultimately for people not to listen to me when something's really important. So we have to develop a filter out of respect for other people 
out of kindness to other people, to better serve God, and to make sure when things are really important that they are heard, that they're heard. Uh, a passage that I like to go to on this is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What does that mean? What does that mean? Think about what you're saying. Think before you speak. Consider the audience. Consider the relationship that we have with that audience. Is what I'm going to say going to be helpful or hurtful for them? I don't need to tell everyone everything all the time. And I feel like in this, this age of online venting, we miss that. Especially our young people are growing up in that, oh man, oftentimes uncensored and, and, and irresponsible communication forum. So that's a conversation that we as parents can, can have and hopefully emulate, pattern the right way for, for, our, for our children and save them from, from potentially great harm. Let's keep reading. In verse 12, Genesis chapter 37, verse 12. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, excuse me, yeah, and he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of your flock and bring word back to me. So here we see again, it sure appears that, that Israel is using Joseph as some sort of, of like manager. Joseph is 17 years old and he's got, he's the next to youngest son and he's got brothers that are, are, are decades older than him, potentially. So here you've got this 17-year-old kid, young man, if you want. Yeah, young man, but, but he's a kid still, in charge of grown married men with kids of their own. So he sent him, back, so he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here, for I have heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went up after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So before we continue, why was Israel using Joseph as some sort of supervisor? Shouldn't that have been Reuben's job? Reuben was the oldest. Reuben had the, the birth right by birth. Reuben probably forfeited his position by sleeping with Israel's concubine. Do you remember that from, from Genesis chapter 35, verse 22? Remember, it, it, it recorded that Reuben slept with Israel's concubine and that there would that, that Israel heard of it. There are consequences. But the boys, as as Joseph, as Jacob, as Israel, sorry, as Israel is setting Joseph up as this supervisor, are looking at all this, and they're going, wait a minute. This young snot nosed punk, this kid is gonna be in charge of all of us. He's gonna get the birthright. You had a bunch of other brothers ahead of him that were probably going, I don't think so. That's mine. Reuben's not going to get it. That's mine. I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. So they weren't okay with this. This is like the perfect storm brewing here for, for familial disputes. I can't imagine their house around the, the, the Thanksgiving table. Uh, man, it's bad enough if if if... if one part of the family likes Alabama and the other likes Auburn, but this is just, this would be brutal. 
So the boys looked at, at Joseph, and I'm reading in here, as, a, as a, an illegitimate heir. And as a tattletale. He was 17. They were grown men. As grown men, they should have known better than what they did next, but their hearts were clearly hardened. So let's continue reading. Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. I'll read through the end of the chapter, make a few points, and we'll bring it to a close. When they saw him from a distance, this is, this is, is Joseph coming to him. When they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They clearly had good eyesight. <laughs> they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. I'm going to come back to that thought. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh, on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silvers. Excuse me. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunics and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Joseph tore his clothes and put sack. So Jacob, forgive me. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. So a few points, then we'll bring it to a close. What was Reuben's motivation for saving Joseph? I think Reuben, you know, Reuben was the oldest brother. It was, in fact, Reuben's responsibility to look out for his younger brothers. And that should be a, a, a natural tendency if we are emulating solid moms and dads. And I would say especially solid dads. If, we're in, if we are as, as old as boys, if they're emulating solid dads who, who treat mom right and treat the kids right, older brothers will naturally or should naturally look out for their younger brothers. And we might pick on one another, but when push comes to shove, brothers are supposed to stick together. And I'm not saying it's right to pick on, on, your, on your siblings. So he knew the right thing to do. He chose not to fully rebuke his younger brothers, and it backfired on him big time. Why did he not stand up to his brothers? Did he add a, a deficient character? Perhaps. Uh, he should not have tried. I think he was trying to manipulate the situation. I think he was trying to, to use, and I'm reading it, I think he was trying to use the situation to get back into Israel's 
good graces. I think he, he, he realized he messed up, and he was trying to get some points with Dad, with the, the spiritual patriarch for the family. But what happened? It backfired on him. He should have had the gumption to do the right thing from the beginning and let the chips fall where they may. And it backfired big time. Can you imagine the, the heartbreak of selling a family member into slavery? I mean, slavery is unconscionable enough, but can you imagine? And I'm, I'm going to touch on that for, for the, the slavery thing for a moment, but can you imagine giving a brother over, giving a family member over to a group of non-believers and putting him at their whim, giving them the power of life and death over a family member. How hard, how hate-filled their hearts must have been. And then to watch the, their dad be just distraught and go through that mourning. How evil, how hard-hearted they, they must have been to stay silent. Have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever stayed silent when you knew the right thing to do, the right thing to say? Isn't that James 4, 17 for the man that knows what is right to do and does it not? It is sin. When there's something that's clearly right to do, we're supposed to stand up. And Reuben and, and none of the other brothers, for that matter, did. Um, this brings up the concept of, of slavery. And so I do want to mention this for a moment. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take next week and, and, and show an old, uh, what the Old Testament says about slavery. And the reason I think this is important is because our young people... And maybe some of us are older folks, but uh, our young people, when they go into college campuses now, there are like these atheist evangelists. And, and one of the things that they're doing is they're, because they can't really refute the science. Like if a kid wants to go to like Apologetics Press and, and, and read the science, it, it becomes very clear that there's a lot of scientific proof and scientific laws that agree with the Genesis account exactly the way it's written. Matter of fact, there's not one scientific law that can refute the way the Genesis account is written. So they can't fight the Genesis account like that. What they do is there a lot of times now it's become more popular. And it's been done in the past too, you know, ebbs and flows of, of what becomes popular uh, in, in popular culture, in our society. So what they do a lot right now, I'm hearing and reading, is they're making emotional appeals, right? So they're saying, oh my goodness, God would allow slavery. Look how evil slavery is. Look what happened in our country. This God can't be a good God. That, this must not be real. No just and loving father would allow slavery. So I think what I'll do next week is I'll go through and I'll present what what was called slavery was supposed to look like for the Israelites. And the reason that's important is this. God has always met broken people where they are. And thank goodness, because let's face it, all of us were enemies to the cross at one point. All of us came to the Lord, and, and many of us still, including myself, in, in some broken way. And God is meeting us where we are, and he's gracefully forgiving us, and he's working with us to help prepare us for mighty deeds. For those of us who choose to turn to his word, and choose to submit, and choose to be honest about what we look like. You know, we can't fool ourselves. We get that from James as well. We have to look at God's word, and be honest about what we look like, and work on it. It's a requirement. It's what God calls us to do. Otherwise, we're not growing, and we're not going in the right direction. So, so God met people where they were. And, and unfortunately, slavery was a part of the world that God was calling, because they were in a sinful, fallen state. It was a part of the world that God was calling the Israelites out of. So what did God do? 
God gave them rules, understanding that this was the world they were coming out of, and understanding that, that this was the economic hierarchy that the world had, and he gave them rules that meant they had to treat their, quote, slaves radically different than the rest of the world did. They had rules and rights that those slaves had to have. Egypt didn't have those rules. Other, the other cultures around them didn't have those rules. So it's very interesting when we actually go through and read what the inspired word says about slavery in the Old Testament, it looks radically different than the world at that time. And, and quite honestly, it looks radically different than some of the horror stories we hear about slavery in this country's early history. And it looks radically different, if you're not aware, than the slave trade that is still booming in other countries on earth right now today. And so, you know, this isn't important since our kids are going to have this spouted at them. It is an important topic to discuss. So I will take a time out and go through that, uh, go through what the Bible says. I'll leave you with two verses on it just to get you thinking in this, in this direction. The first one I want to read is in Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 15 through 16. You check this out. This is God talking to the Israelites about setting slaves free. You shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst, in the place which he shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. What? But I thought this, this evil God condoned horrible slavery. It was different. And the Israelites were to treat their people differently than the rest of the world did. He was helping prepare their hearts, calling them out of a broken state, helping to prepare their hearts for the Christ, for Jesus who was to come. And he told them, look, if somebody runs out of Egypt like you did, or from the Canaanites or whatever, you protect them. You give them a place to stay. You don't turn them back over to that evil way of living where they're going to be harmed. You protect them. We read also another passage where we see something similar, seeing that, hey, God may have met people where they are, but it doesn't mean that he wanted it to continue to be that way forever. In Amos chapter 2, verse 6, and we have to take the whole subject into context, which is why I'll, I'll take a, we'll go through it systematically next week, and we should be able to do that in about 30 minutes. Uh, Amos chapter 2, Amos chapter 2, verse 6. I'm just going to read this one verse. Uh, the, the prophet Amos is, is convicting the Israelites for, for three different behaviors, okay? And the first one, listen to what it is. Thus, this is Amos chapter 2, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. It's referring to slavery. And, and, and God is through Amos saying, that's not okay. You should be selling your brothers into your people, your fellow citizen, into slavery over stuff. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And this stuff is being thrown at our kids. So tune in next week. Uh, we will be, praise God, uh, in, in person, socially distanced and, and doing some modifications, but in person this coming Wednesday uh, at at the Mariposa Avenue Church of Christ, but you can still tune in. This, this class will also be live streamed for those who aren't feeling well or, or for those who, who, or who are at high risk. So to sum up, what do we see through this story of Israel and, and what happened to Joseph? We see dads, moms, we need to lead by example. Uh, we need to look at you know, those things when we're kids and we go, I'm never going to repeat that. Well, in moments of stress, we often do. we got to remember. we got to catch those things. We have to do some, some self-talk and, and, and reprogram. And just because we've done it a couple times, our kids are smart enough to observe us change. 
So we have to we have to be that change that stops the third and fourth generation and can and then starts a new cycle of being blessed by God for thousands. We need to be wise with our words. We need to not be manipulative for our own gain with dealing people, but we need to be people of integrity. We should not take advantage of the weaker or the less fortunate. Let's go as with a prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, thank you so much for your great gift. Thank you. Thank you so much for the truth of your word. May it work on our hearts. May it prepare us for mighty deeds and equip us to help those around us to have a relationship with you. Father, you, Jesus said, pray to entreat you, the, the Lord of the harvest, to send laborers because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Father, work on us and send laborers. And if that means it needs to be us, please make it clear so that we can't ignore the call. Thank you for your mighty gifts, Father. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. All right, guys, God willing, see you all next week.